Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Happy Hour webcast from WhiskeyCast.com. I'm Mark Gillespie in the WhiskeyCast studios. Hope you've had a great week. Uh, hope you didn't have to shovel too much snow. Those of you who live in the uh, northern half of the U.S., we had about a foot of snow here in New Jersey over the last few days. It is now melting, and we're expecting more snow this weekend. So uh, <sighs> the throes of winter. Could be worse, though. Hope you had a great week once again, and thank you for joining us today. In just a minute, I'll be joined by John Quinn, the global brand ambassador for Tullamore Dew and the brand new chairman of the Irish Whiskey Association. Before we start, though, I do want to give you a, a quick update. Uh, we have talked, uh, if you heard this week's webcast, or podcast, rather, you may have heard my comments at the end about uh, our pal Brett Ferenz, the Scotch Trooper. Uh, Brett, as you may know, has been fighting pancreatic cancer for the last uh, seven to eight months now, almost a year. And the other day, he and his family made the decision that uh, he needed to go into hospice care and is hanging hanging on, but his family is expressing the desire for hopes and prayers and good thoughts and any good karma you can send his way. If you want to do something more, there is a, a GoFundMe campaign that has been going now for uh, several months to help with the medical expenses. Uh, when you're a photographer, the uh, medical bills do uh, stack up, especially if you work for yourself. And uh, if you can help with that, you can see the address at the bottom of your screen or go to uh, GoFundMe.com and just search on Trooper, and it'll take you right to uh, the GoFundMe page for Brett. And we want to send him all of our love and our best thoughts. And uh, Godspeed, my friend. We're all thinking of you and your family. And as I said on the podcast the other day, uh, the Whiskey Fabric will be here for Tiffany and the girls uh, for years to come. We'll keep an eye out for them for you. And uh, take good care of my friend. That said, I do want to uh, go ahead and... Uh, Bring in our pal John Quinn now from Tullamore Dew Irish Whiskey. Almost 50 years in the Irish whiskey business, John. And uh, stop, are you stop, still having stop, stop. <laughs> are you still having as much fun now as you did when you started out at Irish Distillers in the 70s? Yeah, I, I, I don't know, Mark. It's great to be here. I, I, it's great to be alive, isn't it? But uh, I, I'm having probably more fun in that uh, now people are giving me credit for stuff that I didn't even do because they can't remember anyway. And, uh, but there it, it's it, when you get old in this business, people sort of respect that you must have achieved something in your life and therefore we better be nice to you. Um, and I'm, I am, I'm loving that bit of it. Uh, I'm, and I'm working with a great team of marketing people in Tullamore, Jew in Dublin and, uh, and in Tullamore, uh, great colleagues, able people really able people but i've worked with really able great people from the 70s and 80s and 90s you know right right through so this is not just for the present team but the present team are brilliant i love i love spending time with them they're young everybody's young in my life mark right even you're young in my life but in my oh, life me, being but working with those young people inspires me energizes me makes me feel not my age and uh yeah and they you know they tolerate me which is very kind and I, anyway i'm en i'm enjoying life i'm loving what i'm doing and um you know so i see peter pulkert saying great beard i'm not ever going to yeah. look at and talk to him again because i know he's really messing me around he's over there in prague anyway well, I, 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 I commented on it when i saw it because i'd never seen you with a beard before but uh, uh, COVID and, uh, does uh, strange things to people when you don't have to travel right you're right and you see everyone i every young male that i I come across who's an ambassador in the business has a good beard and I never had a beard in my life. So on the 1st of January, I said to Sheila, I'm going to let it grow. I'm going to stop shaving. She said, you'll be out of the house in three weeks. I'm still here for the moment. Uh, my grandchildren like it. That's helping a lot. Uh, Sheila's still trying to get used to it, but it'll be there for a little while. I don't know. I might shave it off, but I'm glad I gave it a go. You know, some people tell me I look awful. Some people tell me I look grand. So, you know, you can't please all the people all the time. That's the way it is. Yeah. You'll never please everybody. I let it go for, I think, about three weeks one time for Movember for a prostate yeah. cancer fundraiser a few years ago and was yeah. immediately told, 
yes, that was an honorable intention, but you will never do it again. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, we're getting used to it. Um, I keep telling Sheila, she, you're getting used to it. Um, she's not still not quite convinced, but look, it is, uh, it, it is what it is. And, uh, it'll be there for a little while. And if it makes me look older, it couldn't have had, it didn't have a big job to do there. So <laughs> and Peter says, he says, you look younger. Yeah, but he's a total liar. That guy, you know, he's, <laughs> I believe you, Peter, if you're, if you, if you really say it, I believe you. But anyway, um, I need to introduce him to Sheila again. <laughs> One quick note on our pal Scotch Trooper. Dave Kuhn points out a really good thing. It's an, actually an Alexander McMurray bottling of a 27-year-old uh, Brook Lottie that is co-branded with Brett's uh, Scotch Trooper logo. And all of the proceeds from it are going to the GoFundMe campaign to help cover his medical expenses. I think it sells for about $248. And uh, I think it's through lovescotch.com in the U.S., and they've, I believe they have agreed to donate all of their processing costs to help cover the expense so that more money can go to Brett's GoFundMe. So uh, if you can support that, please, that's one other way you can do it and uh, raise a glass to Brett as well. We've had some comments from folks who have talked to him. Uh, Chris Ratcliffe uh, says he's heartbreaking and off to GoFundMe. Um, and Omar Fitzell. Our pal down in County Cork says the lockdown beard is great as well. <laughs> Thank you, Omar of Cork. Bye. And uh, Dave Cummins says the Beard Brigade, you should belong to it as well. I don't think we've had a listener or viewer on from the Czech Republic in quite a while. Welcome, Zidani, and yeah. I hope I'm not butchering your name there. Yeah, uh, yeah I know him Billy well. Abbott, of course, uh, says beards are overrated. Good man, Billy. <laughs> beards are overrated. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, by the way, now Billy, you tell congratulations. Me. Now you tell me. Billy, congratulations on uh, winning the Icons of Whiskey for the rest of the world in uh, Communicator of the Year. Uh, as a couple of folks have pointed out in the chat room, somebody we're all watching tonight got it for the Americas or from North America. And yes, thank you for that. It's uh, indeed an honor. And a few of our other friends uh, won that for other regions as well. And uh, We'll see what happens when the uh, global icons are announced uh, in a few weeks. What are you pouring there, John? I'm actually pouring a, an XO. I'm near the end of the bottle. Uh, I didn't start this today. Don't worry. Uh, so tell them what your XO. I don't know. Have you tasted Mark? It's um, it's a it's a, a sort of a, a Tullamore, It's our Tullamore Jew original that's been finished in a rum cask from Guyana. I believe I have. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think you have tasted it, and it's um, I absolutely love it now. I went to the, to the press, or the English people call it the cupboard, and uh, I picked it out and I said, it's near the end, but I actually have to, have to admit I have another one in store just in case I run out. Uh, I really love it. I love it as a sippy whiskey. I've also got an 18-year-old here with me, um, and I think you have an 18-year-old there. I have the 18-year-old single malt here as well, so we right. can uh, share that in a few minutes as well. Yeah, exactly. But I, I might just, I'm, I'll just start with this, and then we'll move on to the 18-year-old, and uh, we'll be drinking responsibly even now, though we're not course, driving. We're both at home. So yes, we're drinking responsibly at home. Neither of us is going to be driving tonight. Yeah. Um, question for you. How did you get started at IDL back in the 70s? Uh, that was right around the time that uh, they were shutting down both Powers Johns Lane and the Jameson Distillery in Dublin and moving all the production south to Middleton. Did you, where did you start out at, within IDL and how'd you wind up there? So <clears throat> I started out in a place called Fox and Geese, which is the bottling plant for, you may have been there yourself, Mark, I'm not sure, but it's a, it's a well-known in the Irish whiskey industry. It's a bottling plant for all the Irish service products. And I started in that job because I was studying uh, Irish whiskey as a 17-year-old uh, young lad in Dublin and learning the passion about it. Okay, that's the only lie I'm going to tell you tonight. That's not what happened. I was playing for a football team in Dublin, a Gaelic football team, and my manager of my team said, you're finishing school. Are you going to go on to university? I said, I'm not sure. He said, my brother is the personnel manager in a company called Irish Distillers, and I think you should go and talk to him. I went and talked to him. For whatever reason, he offered me a job, and I started as a 17-year-old in 1974, filling in little books and accounting, uh, accounting for bottles and, 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 and pallets of whiskey and making sure the book was the same as the physical count. It was as exciting as that, 
or not. And he was you trying know. to tell you that your football career was over, right? No, he, he, I think he was kinder than that. I think he was trying to say, and if I get you a job, you'll put in a bit more effort into this thing. So something like that. But uh, a, a, a delightful man he was. And his brother was a, del- a very kind man to give me a job. And uh, yeah, and like it's it's been, it uh, doesn't seem like that long ago. But uh, yeah, I wasn't even shaving, I'd say, probably at that stage. Not, not to mind have a beard, you know. <laughs> See, it comes full circle. Uh, we do Eventually. want to acknowledge Barry Chandler, uh, host uh, of Barry. Stories and Good man, Barry. on the Had line. Good to have a Barry recently, yeah. Uh, Another bloody And uh, Barry also won the Irish Whiskey Communicator of the Year Award from Whiskey well done, Magazine Barry. this week. So Good well man. done, Barry. Yeah. And we say in Irish, we we say in Irish, we say Cogarticus, which means congratulations, Barry. Well done, man. Yeah. Good well crack, done. Barry is too. And uh, Duty Free John is joining us from Buenos Aires oh. tonight. Uh, haven't had well anyone done, from Duty Free on John. in a while. So. Como estas? Uh, Muy bien. Bienvenido, etc. Spirit Bomb Tabitha says uh, she's really getting into Irish whiskey and it's beginning to overtake scotch in her shopping list, and Tullamore Dew is on that list. Uh, Let that be always really on is, your list. Irish whiskey is really making, a, com- is really making a, a comeback worldwide, isn't it? Yeah. To be fair, that, that comeback is going on a good while now, Barry. Um, or, um, <laughs> Barry, Mark. Um, and, and one of the reasons that I say that okay. is that in my life, it was always coming back because when I started in the 70s, it was that. What I didn't know then was a low ebb. Um, and then it was shortly, as you pointed out, it was shortly after the Jemison, the Powers, the Tullamore Jew, and the Cork Distillers brands, Paddy Whiskey particularly, they all came together in 66. Bushmills joined in 72. And then I came to the company in 1974. So it was very recent development that they'd all come together. And the view then was Irish whiskey brands under small individual family companies were never going to be able to take on the Scotch brands of the world or the American whiskey brands of the world. They needed <clears throat> some sort of consolidation <clears throat> of power, brands, money, whatever. And, and, and like we knew, and, and, and it still applies, you need a bit of money to make your whiskey known and popular. You need to get people talking about it. And back then, there was no social media. There were no laptops. There were no computers. The only computers were massive, big machines in rooms that would have the you know, wouldn't have the power of a, of a mobile phone these days. So back then, the coming together of those companies was the start of the revival, if you like. So I've been living this comeback ever since. So when you say in recent times, I'd say yes, in recent times, the difference is it's been a dramatic comeback. Like in the last 10, 15 years particular, it has been dramatic, the, the growth rates. And thank God, thanks be to God, because we, we you know, People like me and many others spent a long number of years, uh, you know, with a lot of shoe leather and a lot of different bars and knocking on doors and all that. Um, and it, it was slow and slow and slow. And in the last 10 or 15 years, it's been racing along. And thank God and thank all the, those people who are out there drinking it. Yeah. Part of that growth was driven by your colleagues at Tullamore Dew with William Grant and Sons uh, since it acquired the brand. I believe it's been about, what, 12, 13 years now? Uh, 2010. Yeah. So, so 11, 11 years. years. Okay. Yeah. 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 But that's building true. That I mean, big look- distillery in Tullamore. And if I remember right, you guys are the only ones in Ireland as of right now. And correct me if I'm wrong on this, that actually produce all three styles of scotch or that's my mistake. Now all three Martin styles of Irish Martin whiskey Martin. Under, the forgive under the same uh, roof, under the same roof in terms of grain, single pot still and single malt. Right. Uh, to be fair, we're not the only ones who do that. We are the only ones who grow, go from grain to glass with all three styles of whiskey on the, on the same campus. Yeah. Um, uh, to, to be fair, let's give credit to Royal Oak Distillery. They do the same. They do the three of them under the same roof. Um, but we, we, we go from grain, uh, uh, grain input to milling, uh, mashing, fermentation, distillation, maturation, and bottling all on the one side. And that's something we're very proud of. It's something that is, uh, for a lot of reasons, is good for the industry. It's, it's good in terms of our carbon footprint. Obviously, we're not moving. So all of those things uh, coming together, it, it's, 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 it's a wonderful way to be doing it. I'd have to say, Barry, Mark, if, I, if Barry bloody Chandler, uh, would only get out of my head. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> anyway, Mark, you're forgetting. Um, it's okay. But I, I no, but I had another interview with another Barry yesterday, so that name is sticking with me. But I, I must say, Mark, that I've told you I've had a wonderful life in Irish whiskey, and I have, thank God. But when I was with Irish Distillers, all the brands, and uh, obviously since you know back then when I was solely with Tullamore Jew, but the best ten years have been the ten, the last ten years, including and probably because of the fact that William Grant's as owners have decided this brand deserves a world-class distillery uh, facility and this brand deserves investment at the production end as well as at the marketing end and that's the first time you know since 1954 that we've had our own distillery up to now we've it's been as you know been distilled under license for us so now we have everything ourselves and it, and it's it's wonderful and it's such a, a joy a thrill you were there it's uh, you picked up on how it's much I enjoyed book. taking people, but how much, how enjoyable it is to take people around there, you know? And it's not a dirty old distillery. Like keep telling people that. It's not a dirty old distillery. Don't come look for an old cobweb distillery. It's a modern facility that is so well built. And in terms of, you know, uh, uh, reuse of, uh, of our uh, energy sources, in terms of our carbon footprint, it's, it's, it's a model. And it's a model that our friends in Scotland, in our company, have told me that if, if they begin, if they build a distillery again in Scotland, that the, the Tullamore model will be the one that will guide that, you know. But anyway, I better stop talking about it because I'll bore the backside off your listeners. No, you haven't. And uh, Barry, Barry points out that I've probably been called worse. And yeah, I have. <laughs> um, <laughs> Richard Jankovic points out, uh, and this was the question I was getting to when you were talking about the marketing side, uh, Tullamore do the visitor center at the old uh, warehouses in downtown Tullamore, for lack of a better term, yeah. uh, yes. has closed down. Now, what are the plans to uh, put something in place out at the distillery? So the plans are rich in terms of their content and their motivation. And the plans are that from now on, when people want to visit the Tullamore distillery whiskey facility they will come to the actual distillery whereas as you know many tourists would have visited the visitor center and saw the history beautifully presented and great tour guides telling the story extremely well with great passion but there was always that bit of but it's not at the distillery and we had the distillery three miles out the road so what we will have in the future is a facility with in what job are you within the distillery the magnificent distillery that we have and lovely visitor facilities to be fair they will be reordered slightly to make it a visitor facility that includes the distillery visit that allows people to learn and to understand and pick up all the passion points that we will deliver but they will see the whiskey being made they will see the mashing they'll see the milling they will see the whiskey dripping from in the spirit safe they'll get all of the beauty that that is and then they'll go and see it being put into casks and being laid down for years in dark aromatic warehouses and ultimately being bottled and that and that experience has to be so much the aspiration for us and for everyone in, in the whiskey business to be able to give visitors that and that's what we will be doing it's going to take until summer maybe july before we're ready but the uh, we we have the go ahead to do it we have the people doing the vis visioning. We have the, the reordering of the distillery complex. My colleague, Kevin Piggott, I don't know if you know Kevin Piggott. I don't. Brilliant, a brilliant guy. He's, absolutely, he's far better at this job than I am. And he is planning and organizing how that, that with, with the team of Cathy Sullivan and a few more, on how this will all look. And uh, it's, it's going to be superb. It's going to be superb. And we're very sorry to lose the facility in, at, at Bury Key which the guys did so well. But in order to move forward, this is the right thing to do. And, you know, we always talk in the whiskey business, as you would too, Mark. You don't talk about the next five years or 10 years even. You talk about 20 or 50 years. And with that in mind, this is the right thing to do. And Graham Frazier wants to know if the old Tullamore Dew buildings still exist and are they owned by William Grant? Well, that was the old visitor's center was in one of the warehouses, right? Along it was an old bonded warehouse, canal. absolutely, on the canal. An old bonded warehouse on the canal. <clears throat> and yes, we still own that building. We absolutely still own that building. What will happen to that building in the future is something that will be uh, paid great attention to on our part. Whether it uh, is something we don't own in the future and somebody else owns it 
is 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 on the cards obviously but it would be something that we would be very attentive to what a new owner might want to do or would want to do with it so it's 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 part of our makeup almost so we would want to be sure that uh, any use for it in the future would be appropriate and i know you're working with the the town as well to make sure that there's an appropriate use for that as well, right? Absolutely, we're in, con in consultation with lots of people in Tullamore. <clears throat> we're part of the fabric of the town. The people of the town know us, trust us, and we will be doing we're doing everything we can to make sure that the right thing happens with that building. And let's explain, the old distillery was basically closed in 1954, the B. Daly Distillery. Yeah. And eventually it was torn down, but the stills from that st distillery still exist and can be seen a few miles up the road at Kilbegan. Correct. Where the uh, pot stills that are out in the yard, they salvaged those stills when the building was torn down. That's right. That's right. And the people at Kilbegan salvaged those and kept them. And then uh, around to, you know, 2011 or thereabouts, my daughter was working for the, uh, for my daughter Rachel was working for the Kilbegan people. And I said to her, we're just going to come and take those stills off you. Uh, it, it didn't happen. She wasn't that keen. So uh, they're still there for people to look at. Absolutely. Yeah, they're still there. And I have several questions coming in. Will there be warehouse tastings in the new tour? I'm sure that hasn't been decided yet, right? So it hasn't been decided yet in terms of exactly where the tastings will happen. One of the things about warehouse tastings you'd have to be a little bit careful about, <coughs> excuse me, frog in my throat, uh, sometimes is that customs and excise people are happy that you're uh, managing the facility appropriately and that uh, everything is being done uh, to, to the book. Um, so th that will be discussed and exactly how and where we will do the tastings. But sometimes also warehouse tastings, whilst they're very enjoyable in terms of atmosphere, sometimes you're keen to get back into a bit of heat in a, in a building where you can sit down and taste several whiskies at your leisure, rather than maybe being in a warehouse where it's not going to be terribly warm in January, or February, or March, or December. You know, so and, there will be there will be all of those things will be thought through. And if I remember correctly from visiting the warehouses at Tullamore, you guys are using palletized storage, which uh, is not quite as romantic as uh, storing barrels on their side in dunnage style warehouses where you can. Uh, Go out yeah. and pick out an individual cask and tap it. You've got these uh, giant stacks of barrels on pallets that uh, are all stored vertically and are harder to get into, right? That's right. Um, better use of space, you might say. Um, not as romantic, but uh, again, going back to sustainability, better use of space, better, less movement, <clears throat> less requirement for uh, space to be to be overtaken. So from that point of view, there's a whole lot of reasons why it's right to do palletized warehouse. I dream of having a little dunnage warehouse in, in the Tullamore distillery, but for, for the purposes of sustainability and doing the right thing for the environment, it's not really the best way to go. Yeah. And they wouldn't Question listen to me anyway, Barry. Kuhn. Question from Dave Kuhn for your, about your role as chairman of the Irish Whiskey Association. How does it compare to the Scotch Whiskey Association? Uh, Dave points out that we hear a lot about how protective the Scotch Whiskey Association is of uh, Scotland's uh, intellectual property, whatever you want to call it, worldwide. Is the IWA as staunch yet? I know it's still relatively in its infancy compared to the, uh, the boys in Scotland, at least in terms of the trade group side. Yeah, I mean, the Irish Whiskey Association was set up in 2014 after many years of discussions between the players at that time to get agreement that the association would be set up in the way that it is, but also using the, um, the facility of informed people in the Scotch, Scotch Whiskey Association to help us structure ourselves in a way that would give us that staunchness that Dave talks about. The point I suppose I would make is that we don't we don't copy the Scotch Whiskey Association in everything that we do and they do, but they're certainly a great model for us to build our association around. So we're seven years, we're coming up to seven years on the go now. You know, we're we're brand spanking new, but we've had seven years' experience and expertise at this stage. Um, and the, the what what we what we set about 
and the re our reason for being really is the protection of the Irish whiskey category so that um, others can't undermine the quality credentials of the of the players who are involved and and we do that with, if, with many in many ways but I can tell you that a big part of our budget is spent on protection legal protection uh, we've we've uh, as you know we have a registered GI geographic indication which protects Irish whiskey from being undermined by non <coughs> GI Irish whiskies and in in terms of registration marks in different countries like if that's a GI mark or a certification mark in the US we spend all of our time on that and on picking out and picking on products that purport to be Irish whiskey with leprechauns or shamrocks on the label that aren't actually made in Ireland and we bring those to the relevant authorities so that they can have uh, to take take the moves knowing that we have protection from our GI or certification mark yeah so Dave's point about protection absolutely well, you could send uh, Conor McGregor or some of the boys from Dublin MMA fighting over to uh, just take care of it themselves and save the legal bills. Sorry, Mark, I can't hear you there. You're just gone. I missed you there. <laughs> I'm going to assume that's a no comment then. I was just, I was just joking <laughs> that you could send uh, some of the MMA fighters. No, I did from hear Dublin you. I did hear you. you didn't have to... <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, let's turn to politics. Staying on politics for a second, Chris Ratcliffe wants to know how, if you've seen any indications yet how Brexit is affecting the industry. Um, how are sales to the across the border over to the rest of Great Britain, other than Northern Ireland? Because uh, we know the yeah. the border between the Republic and Northern Ireland is still open. Yeah, and Irish whiskey is an All Ireland uh, association. There's an association Irish whiskey industry, All Ireland industry. Um, we're not seeing any significant effects just yet, but it is a bit early. It is just a bit early now. The other thing to say is there will be no tariffs between Ireland and the UK, so there would be no increase in prices for Irish whiskey in the UK or for Scotch whiskey in Ireland. So. Tariffs won't be the, the pricing won't be the issue. If there's any issue around it, it might be around logistics, getting the trucks with the whiskey on board on the boats through the ports, getting the paperwork done. To be fair, we haven't had feedback from anybody that it's a real pain in the butt just yet. Um, but I do know that that whole logistics issue of trucks and, and, and boats between the UK and Europe um are, are uh, there are problems within for many of the in, many industries especially fresh product industries that need like fish for example is a big issue now but that need the product to be shipped very quickly and get across to the marketplace very quickly um and with the logistics difficulties around documentation particularly they're having problems we don't seem to be having those problems at the moment at least i haven't had them reported to me as being a real issue and let's explain the difference on the border right now. That was everyone was worried about the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland during the whole Brexit run up. Yeah. That is pretty much sacrosanct because of the Good Friday Accords, right? Yeah. So there's within the free trade agreement that was developed between the EU and uh, and the UK, um, the there is there's a clause in that called the Northern Ireland Protocol. And the Northern Ireland Protocol says that products destined from the EU, for the EU, from Britain coming into Northern Ireland, in other words, destined for the Republic of Ireland, will have will have checks um, as they arrive into Northern Ireland, rather than, if you like, um, checks between Northern Ireland and the Republic. So the border doesn't exist; it won't exist. The the, the aspiration and and the Good Friday Agreement has written down that there was be no reintroduction of any border there. So this protocol within the uh, free trade agreement allows that to happen. So in a sense, the borders down the Irish Sea. It, it, not everybody's 100% happy with that, but it's the best option in terms of keeping the integrity of the island uh, as, as, as we wanted it to be. I think the folks that are most unhappy with it are members of the Democratic Unionist Party in the North, right? That's true, Barry. Yeah, they, that, that's a mark. That's true. But on the other hand, uh, they probably wouldn't have wanted. Um, they were they were pro the Brexit in the first place, and they probably wouldn't have wanted any protocol like that ever to happen. And now, with the difficulties between uh, you know you know tr goods traveling from the from Great Britain to Northern Ireland are being held up with documentation as well for the same reasons. They're they're struggling with that, and they they want that looked at again. 
Let's get back to your whiskeys for a second. Dave Kuhn is taking a dry February. Um, admire that, oh. Dave. The shortest month of the year to uh, go dry. <laughs> I kid, of course. But uh, someone currently taking a short drink, break from drinking and a gluten, I think you meant to say glutton for punishment. Can you describe <laughs> the tasting notes of the core expression Tullamore Dew, John? <clears throat> I could probably do that. I'm sure I've done that sometime before. Let me see if I can remember. I think you've yeah. it a few times. <clears throat> Look, Tullamore Dew, we always talk about the power of three with Tullamore Dew. We always explain to people that in the world of whiskies, there are three styles that are really made in Ireland. There are this grain whiskey, um, which we know is a continuous distillation, is, is a, can be made from wheat, maize, etc. Um, wheat, maize, corn, etc. So, and that style of whiskey is one of our... Con um, if you like um, component whiskies, the second style is single malt. Everybody knows that single malt is. It tends to be a rich, fruity uh, style of whiskey, which has lots of body. And the third style is pot still whiskey. And pot still whiskey tends to be, in the taste profile terms, have a bit of spice um, and tends to be rich in mouthfeel, etc. So we've got the sweetness of the grain. We have the fruit of the malt, and we've got the spice of the pot still. And that, because it's a blend of all three, what we call a triple blend, each of those whiskies are triple distilled, of course. And because it's a blend of all three, it brings out many different things. The fact is that we are also maturing in ex-Irish whiskey casks, in ex-bourbon casks, and using some sherry cask in the maturation of the pot still as well. So now, now we've got a lot of influences in there. And so if I was to describe, I would say, look, it's 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 a lovely sweetness, but it's a vanilla sweetness, not a sugar sweetness. And that vanilla is coming from the bourbon casks and the, and the ex Irish whiskey casks. It's got a fruitiness, a kind of a green apple fruitiness, which is which is really attractive. Again, a nice freshness like that. And then there's a little gentle spice at the back, which is coming from the pot still, but also from the sherry cask finish. Gentle spice, maybe you might say, uh, Christmas cake fruits or uh, sultanas raisins, that kind of thing. The dried fruits, they're at the end. And so it, it, there's a richness, there's a richness in it. There's also an attractiveness in it. It's because all the whiskies are triple distilled. There's been a lot of wood used. It's extremely smooth. Every whiskey is smooth. I've never heard a whiskey company say, you'd love our whiskey because it's rough. Okay, that doesn't, nobody says it. But it's, it, people who drink it uh, for the first time say to me, oh, I, I, I can't believe it's so smooth. And, and I, I know what they mean. Um, and, and my competitors, are smooth as well, by the way, just in case anyone's doubting my allegiance. Yeah. But hopefully that's it. It's really, that's the point. It's vanilla sweet. It's up, it's green apple fruit and fruit spice at the end. That's, that's how I describe it. Was that Dave who asked that? I can't remember. I think so. Um, but, uh, Peter, and we've had several people ask this, a, a variation on this question. Uh, what proportion of single malt pot still and grain whiskey made in your new distillery is now actually being bottled in the Tullamore Dew original. And at what point do you think you might have a 100% whiskey distilled from your own distillate? I, let's be honest, uh, there was a supply contract with Irish distillers for whiskey that yep. had uh, was in place when William Grant acquired the place. Absolutely. And... Uh, and we, were blessed, we were blessed to have Middleton distilleries producing our grain and our pot still. We got the Bushmills distillery to produce our single malt. We, they were produced for us under license and we were able to blend them. At the moment, we have our single malt and our single pot still, virtually all of it coming from the Tullamore Jew distillery in our blend, going into our blend. The grain whiskey is still coming from our Middleton license because our grain whiskey is coming up to four years old. Uh, it's not ready yet. It, it can be ready at three years old, of course, but we're, we, we think that we, we've always used at least four-year-old whiskey in our grain, usually older. Um, so it, it would be probably into 2022 when we could say it would be 100% 100, 100 uh, whiskey from the Tullamore Distillery. But we're blessed to get great whiskey from the Middleton Distillery to help us out for the moment. Are you going to make a big deal out of that when you do get to go 100% Tullamore Distillery? We're not going to tell Peter Pulkert anyway, I can tell you that much, but uh, no, the, <laughs> in fairness, in, so I'm going to say this because everybody on this call is a whiskey enthusiast and has a bit of knowledge. Um, it, it's, it doesn't help 
if you go out and tell people your whiskey is now going to come from a different distillery because those who don't understand the whiskey industry might get worried that something will change. They might. So it's not something that you go out and wave banners about. But for those who are interested in whiskies, they will get it and they will be looking for the nuances if there are any nuances to be found. Um, so yeah, that no, we're not going to uh, go out on, on the on the airwaves about it. But for the whiskey enthusiasts who are enthusiastic or enthusiasts who ask me, I'll tell them. Yeah. When so you at some point, and I don't want to get out ahead of your marketing side on this, but uh, the single malts like this eighteen year old obviously are older single malts. But at what point will Will we start to see some of the uh, single malts coming out that will have the uh, Tullamore yeah. distillate? So our single malts are six and a half years old now. Um, if our uh, pot stills as well. And so, and I've had this conversation with many people just in the last week, actually, as it turns out. But um, I suppose our feeling is that if we're going to launch a single malt or a single pot still, we'll wait until they're in age within which the industry sort of recognizes that's about the right time. We could have launched a three-year-old, a four-year-old, five-year-old single pot still, I, I, or single malt. I, I personally didn't think it was right to do that. Um, I'm not the final decision maker on that. We have a team of people who decide that. But we didn't feel that it, it was right to launch something just because Mark Gillespie and Peter Pulkert and other people are dying to taste that whiskey. You guys will taste it when you visit the distillery if you haven't tasted some of it already. But we, we will do it on the basis that it's the right time for the consumer who might expect well, a single malt to be a certain age. Do you know what I mean? I haven't tasted it because when I was there, it was still too young and you were making us taste uh, the older stuff from Middleton and uh, Bushmills. Okay. So it's been okay. a while since it's been three or four years since I've been there. So the stuff wasn't old enough yet. You couldn't call well, it whiskey. Well, you will you will have your chance. You may be sure you will. And yes. when you do, the next time you will definitely be tasting what we have in Tullamore. And it's magnificent, I have to tell you. And uh, we've had a few of the Irish Whiskey Society people visit from uh, Irish Whiskey Society, from the uh, aviators in Dublin, these kind of people. And they've had an opportunity to taste it. Kilkenny Whiskey Guild people have come and they're very very positive they want us to launch it of course oh yeah it's wonderful you have to launch it but we have to be smart about our we have to be smart about a lot of things including our bottling hall and and facilities that we have and how we use them yeah and chris ratcliffe asks who's doing the berry drinking game tyrone Coty says okay next time john says berry he has to take a drink so the guys are watching and having good fun with this um hey champill my age lads it's my age for god's sake has anyone tried a blend of Scotch and Irish whiskey? And I know the answer to this one, but go ahead, John, if you want to take it first. I know it was tried once and well, uh, got smacked down on the Scottish side. Yeah, it was tried once and got smashed down the Scottish side. And um, I guess you would, on the on the one hand, you'd say a great uh, idea for innovation and uh, an off the wall and a bit of creative left field idea. Or you could look at it and say, yeah, what do you... What are you trying to do? Because although you're making, you're bringing two uh, dis traditions together, you're neither recognizing one or the other well, particularly well. So it was tried, and uh, you're right, it didn't, it didn't get get off the mark. Um, and I'm not sure that it would have been something that people would have wanted to spend much time with in any case. I'm not sure. I didn't taste it myself. You got it there, have you? No, this is not it. No, that was the uh, no. the, the Celtic Nations thing that uh, yeah. Brooke Laddie yeah. did with Bushmills, where they blended yeah. the two whiskeys because those distillers were the closest to each other on both yeah. sides of the water between yeah. Isla and Ireland. So yeah, they there did might have been another one, another, ago, another but, one tried as well, I think. But uh, yeah, I mean, as I say, the positive side of it is it's wonderfully creative, great out of the box thinking. The negative side of it is which tradition is protected or enhanced by this. So there's arguments for both. And as other folks have pointed out, the Suntory AO, but uh, that was a combination of five different countries. That was uh, Ireland, Scotland, Canada, Japan, and the US. So it wasn't just a uh, Scotch and Irish uh, blend. It, sounds like, a, and, it sounds, sounds like a great idea for a charity bottling. Yeah. Yeah. 
And uh, there was apparently a hybrid from Teeling that I'm not familiar with. They didn't. That's that's that what I was detail. saying. There was another one done, and there was John Teeling yeah. rather than the Sons. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Thank you, Zidane. And You're then, right. Uh, and Tyrone Curtis thinks that's a great idea regarding waiting, because too many have released products too early. Now, what I have switched over to is uh, one of the whiskeys from the revival of the classic a era of Irish whiskey bonding from uh, our friend uh, Louise McWayne at JJ Corey in Chapel Gate. Uh, her uh, Mezcal-influenced uh, Irish whiskey that yeah. uh, she released the uh, Battalion, yeah. which I thought was interesting enough that I, because I really actually like this one. And I'm not I a big Mezcal person. Yeah, great. I haven't but, tasted uh, it myself, I must admit. But let's talk about the history of Irish whiskey bonding, because uh, that's one thing that was unique to Ireland from pretty much every place else in the world was that... Uh, Bars and pubs were getting barrels straight from the distillery at times, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it was. And the, the point was, it was almost like it was as common as bottled whiskey uh, or even at one stage, probably more common. But I mean, I grew up in my life. I knew and know uh, the bars around where I lived that were bonders, whiskey bonders. And they had their own whiskey from the distillers and in fact one of them is not too far from my house and he uh, the owner uh, the pub is called Hedigans and uh, the owner of the pub told me that um when Irish distillers wanted them to stop being bought that, that's bonders, Michael right Michael Hedigan exactly well done yeah, Mike, you know, yeah he's you, been on the, we you know on the more people than me years ago yeah, he, ah, yeah no, brilliant. that was because I've been to Hedigan. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a brilliant pub, the Brian Brew, it's called. Love yeah. That place. So, yeah. you know, Michael, he's a topper. And yeah. um, so, uh, Michael was telling me that the, the, there was a man called Frank O'Reilly who was head of the Powers family, right? And it was Frank O'Reilly who inspired the coming together of the Powers, Jemsons, and Cork Distillers people. He decided that this would be a very good thing to do. He be, ultimately became chairman of our distillers group when I was there. But it was he who would have visited a lot of the bonding, uh, the bonders and said, look, guys, we want you to stop taking bonded whiskeys and we're sorry, but we're going to bottle it. And um, they would have had actually even a bottle, a label on the bottle that might have been a different color from the regular powers or from the regular Jemison to indicate that it was a, a bonders whiskey, if you like, but that they weren't pouring it from their their. Uh, casks in the bar they were, they were taking in bottles and ultimately they would have taken that special label away eventually and said look we want you to buy the regular Tullamore Dew, the regular Jemison, the regular Powers uh, in order that we can have a consistency there might have been some suggestion that um, I don't know there might have been some suggestion that people weren't using exactly all the correct whiskey in what they were pouring and therefore the distillers needed to protect the future of the brand's reputation i'm not saying not obviously hedigans obviously not hedigans but um you know that that, that was a, a principal decision taken by the distillers at the time but yeah it was unique i mean i there are still bars in dublin that you can go around and see written over their windows a uh, whiskey bonder you know so they they still exist those bars but they don't bond whiskey anymore Good question from Tor Christensen in Norway. Could you say something about the Irish whiskey tourism industry versus the Scottish? And we know that Ireland, of course, gets massive amounts of tourism most years. This past year has been uh, the exception to the rule. But uh, sure. how is Irish whiskey tourism growing before the pandemic? And what do you hope it will return to? So Irish whiskey tourism was growing phenomenally well. Um, yeah, we were heading towards a million people visiting the various distilleries in Ireland in 2019. Uh, sadly, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that should be on silent, but sadly that all, um, that c collapsed last year as everywhere collapsed last year. So that's, but um, the Irish whiskey tourism product versus Scotch whiskey tourism product. Look, if you've done any Scotch whiskey, whiskey tourism, it's a magnificent experience to go to, uh, you, you know, Isla or, or to go to, some of the, uh, the space eye distilleries going to the highlands. Oh my God, it's a magnificent uh, visiting experience and an experience for a tourist. We are at the start of that and we hopefully will have a product every bit as interesting and, and, and as good. Our, our distilleries will be more spread out about around Ireland rather than in, in sort of in pockets or on single islands. So it'll probably take you around the whole country to visit the distilleries. We have now 38 distilleries in Ireland, 38 distilleries from four in 2010. So there's a lot of visiting potential. It's been a tough year for us though. 
um, and a tough year for everybody, let's say. Um, and this wasn't in the five year, 10, 15 year plan that we wouldn't have any tourists. But on the other hand, uh, if and when it takes off, we would love to think that people will be as positive as about, about the Irish whiskey tourism industry as I am about the Scotch whiskey tourism industry, because I think they do a great job. And their whiskey isn't great, as you know, Mark. On the other hand, their tourism products are fantastic. No, I take that back. They make wonderful whiskey. David Paradise and other people that I know from the Scotch whiskey industry are listening to this. And uh, of course, of course, it's make wonderful whiskey as well. So who invented whiskey, the Scots or the Irish? Let's start Chinese, that trouble right the now. Chinese, the Chinese, definitely. Uh, the Japanese perfected it. No, <clears throat> it's a great debate. And <laughs> sorry, that wasn't fair. It's a great debate in that uh, we what we, we always will ask, uh, will ask the same question. But there is a general acceptance that the the whiskies, uh, the, the Ishkabaha distillation uh, idea moved across from the Middle East. We would say it came with Christianity, with the monks moving in. They moved into Ireland. They brought Christianity and they brought that secret of distillation that, and they, uh, you know, the, the old Irish Pishog, which uh, Pishog, what's a Pishog? Uh, it's an old Irish story, right? It's an Irish word for an old Irish legend. The old Irish Pishog says, and uh, the Irish uh, soon found a better use for it, of course, uh, the, than, than, for, uh, uh, than, than the flora and the, the uh, herbal essences, etc. So we made whiskey and then it was taken to Scotland. What I can tell you, is that if you ever read Charlie McLean's books or if you ever look at Charlie McLean's video on YouTube where he stands at the cross in Kilcoman and he talks about Fergus McVeigh, a medical man, Fergus Beaton, it's a wonderful evocation of how a Scotch whiskey historian will tell you that it came from Ireland. And I will quote Charlie McLean long after I'm dead because he is... The quintessential, you know him, he's a quintessential yeah. historian of Scotch whiskey. He's, he's a reference book for everybody. And he says, this is where it started. And it was Fergus McVeigh or Fergus Beaton who brought it from Ireland in the first place. So I give credit well, makes, to Charlie McLean. It, it makes sense because the monks, as they were moving up along the Atlantic coast, started in Ireland before they exactly. got to Scotland. So it, it would make Absolutely. sense to that point. Um, yeah. And, and the a, there was a monk called, uh, there was, a, there was, the, the Irish Scots question, can't be the English. Yeah, Billy Abbott's <laughs> going to start trouble tonight. So Billy, can I just tell you, that would keep nobody happy if you said that. Don't be, don't be suggesting for a minute to keep the, anybody happy or everyone, nobody be happy with that. But in fact, there, there is an island of Scotland called Iona, the island of Iona, and it's a very mm -hmm. famous Christian place. And uh, St. Columbus founded the I know, uh, I know, we came from Donegal across. And St. Columbus is the name of the parish church that I live in. The address I live in is Iona Villas, because St. Columbus went and brought Christianity to Iona in Scotland. And where I live is actually called after that island. So there you go. More, more useless sure. information for everybody to write down. And hey, we specialize in useless information around here. <laughs> I've listened to some of your podcasts, by the way, and your broadcast. None of them have been as useless as this. I can tell you that they've always been very informative. Oh, we'll start. We'll we'll try. We'll see what we can do about that. But uh, okay, hey, Champ Hill, would you guys ever consider Solera vat blending? Uh, sort of like what some of the uh, what some distilleries yeah. have done, where you you top things off every few years. Yeah, would you have you guys so, ever thought about that, or is that a uh, is that a kinsman question? Well, let me let's put it this way. The most famous Falera, Solera Reserve whiskey that I know is a Glenfiddich 15 year old. It might be one of my favorite whiskeys after every single Tullamore Jew expression that I've ever tasted. Okay, it is a wonderful whiskey, and that is a Solera Reserve um, uh, production process. And uh, on the basis that we're a sister company with the guys in Glenfiddich, what do you think? I think there's every chance that could happen, you yeah. know. So, um, and certainly. Those of us who are on that side of advocating for what all whatever is right for Tullamore Jew within a, a burgeoning Irish whiskey industry and market, something that I'd like us to look at. But that's a secret that I can't tell anybody else about. Oh, how much influence does Brian Kinsman have in making that decision as the malt master for William Grant and Sons? So he is a wonderfully important person. He's wonderful because of his incredible uh, knowledge 
his 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 palate his understanding of maturation and what it might taste like in five ten years time he's he's like i don't think i've never met anyone like him but and therefore yeah. he would be hugely instrumental in that decision we would talk to him about it we might say we think it could work he will bring his expertise in terms of what happens at glenfiddich to bear on how it would best happen with Tullamore. So absolutely, he would be the man who would guide us through that. We might have the idea, or we might see how it might, what it might look like, or might want it to taste like, but he would guide us through how to get there. Yeah. And Peter Polkert is asking, do you personally get to go taste the whiskey in the warehouses often? Does Brian do it uh, to go to the warehouses, or does he have the samples delivered to his office in Scotland? So what actually happens is every period it could be a month or two months um there will be several hundred samples taken from the casks and will be delivered to the lab in tullamore and some of those will go to scotland to brian in scotland as well but we have a lab in tullamore that uh, where people have been trained to uh, assess the whiskies but every time we would take those samples samples would go to scotland for control and every time we might use whiskies for bottling samples would be going to scotland and staying in tullamore for our future reference so yes do i go down and take those 200 samples no um because uh they wouldn't trust me i suppose but other people will do that but i've been there when they're doing it and yes of course i've tasted peter Pulker knows well that i've tasted whiskies from casks in tullamore because so has he but uh yes i do yeah but not it's not my job to do that other people do that as their job tabitha says how about if we say the french invented whiskey you really want Pourquoi to start pas. trouble with that. Pourquoi one. pas. Absolutely, yeah. Nobody will believe it, so we should say it. Yeah. So I know the answer to this, but let's. I want you to explain it. You're the brand ambassador. Dave Keen wants to know, what's the story behind the do part of Tullamore Do? So let me tell you, Dave. Here's how I'm going to explain it. Do you see way, the way you wrote D-E-W? That is incorrect. The way it's written is uh, uppercase D, full stop, uppercase E, full stop, uppercase U, full stop. I'm going to do that that way. And the reason for that is because DEW stands for Daniel Edmund Williams. Who in the name of God was Daniel Edmund Williams? Well, when the distillery was owned first by the Malloy brothers, they actually left it to uh, their nephew, Bernard Daly. He left it to his family, to a Captain Bernard Daly, who didn't have a great interest in the business, but had a young man working in the business. His name was Daniel Edmund Williams. OK, and Daniel Edmund Williams as a, as a start in the business as a 14 year old boy working in the stables and in the, the hayloft, uh, sleeping at the distillery and eventually becoming the general manager when he was 25. Now, just to be clear for everybody. We don't inv employ 14 year old or 15 year old boys anymore. We don't at the distillery. We find the 16 year olds are much better for carrying the casks and their spine doesn't bend as fast. OK. That's a line that I got from somebody else I shouldn't say. But no, of course we don't. But the, the truth is that as a 25-year-old, he became the general Back then it manager. was legal. I'm sure it was. <laughs> a lot of things were legal back then. That you can't it was encouraged today. back then. <laughs> exactly. So I better take a drink. This is uh, getting beyond that. Mm. He took over as a 25-year-old man. He took over as the general manager. Eventually, he and his family bought the business out from the Daly family. And that's how it became the Tullamore Jew Daniel Lee Williams business. And they launched the Tullamore DEW, Tullamore Jew brand um, back then. And, and it has a famous marketing, it's like the most famous marketing slogan in the Irish whiskey industry for many, many years was, well, give every man his due. And of course, smart Alex that they were advertising was not to be seen too much around, but everybody remembered that one. Um, but it was Daniel Lee Williams, Daniel Williams's company that, that bought it from the dailies and started to build a business. And ultimately, oh, there's a better story than that then. Okay, let me tell you. Daniel Williams had a granddaughter. Her name was Teresa Williams, okay? One day she was proposed to and got married to a man called Frank O'Reilly, the head of the Powers family. And ultimately, Powers took over the Tullamore Jew brand, and that's how... Tullamore Jew and Powers became sister, brother and sister brands. And that's how the Tullamore Jew became part of the Irish Distillers merger when it happened. Pillow talk, when Frank O'Reilly's wife, Teresa Williams, said to him, you should buy Tullamore Jew, take it into the family. I don't know if it's pillow talk. That's not appropriate. But anyway. 
Well, that's a smart move. We had uh, Fanon O'Connor, who is sort of the expert on all things uh, single pot still and pot still distilling in Ireland, on the show a couple of weeks ago Yeah, on the podcast and talked to him about the uh, changes that may be coming to the technical regulations. And with that, uh, Graham Frazier wants to know, will the Irish whiskey technical rules be tightened up in the future with the growth of Irish distilling? Uh, explain where the uh, Irish Whiskey Association stands on this, because uh, there was the technical file that is filed with the EU for the <coughs> geographical indicator for Irish whiskey that we discussed earlier limits the amount of grains other than malted and unmalted barley that can be used in single pot still to, I believe, 5%. And Correct. part of Fanon's research that he was doing at Boan Distillery, historical research shows that those other grains were, back in the day, used in much higher proportions. And there's some talk of trying to loosen that restriction up. Where do you see yeah, so, the uh, technical yeah, regulations? So Graham's, Graham's question is interesting because he asks, is it going to be tightened up? And as you rightly pointed out, with Fanon's research, um, which was actually beyond the Boan, it's, he, he's sitting with you in Boan Distillery, but <clears throat> he did some research, including in their own facility. And he's done, mm -hmm. he's a wonderful, wonderful guy. Absolutely. I'm, I'm a lover of that young man for what he does and his, and his, his attention to his scholarship is fantastic. And what he is finding uh, I, I has joked, found... I would like to have been on as a son-in-law. Uh, he's absolutely amazing. He's amazing. And he and I have had conversations about this. <clears throat> the Irish Whiskey Technical File, um, in terms of mash bills for single pot still whiskey, is very defined, as you described, with minimum 30% malted barley, minimum 30% of unwalted barley and then a maximum of five percent of other grains and that was a decision that and a definition that was agreed after many years of, of discussion between the whiskey companies in 2000 and finally in 2014 when the technical file was completed and sent for ratification and sent for geographic indication um, uh, con confirmation by the eu so that technical file has stood up very well and you'd have to say that the single pot still category, as is evidenced by the many wonderful whiskies in that, has stood up very well and has burgeoned and has, you know, uh, people who drink single pot stills. Let's mention one of my competitors here. Let's mention Redbreast. It's very difficult to be critical of that whiskey, isn't it? It's a wonderful whiskey. Well, that comes within the technical file definition. So that's Fine. exactly. So that's sponsored well done so that comes my point is that you don't want to be messing around with something that that's that's that good equally you have to pay attention to what Fanon is telling us about not just the traditional but the historical references that he's finding and what he's finding is terribly interesting so the Irish Whiskey Association during the next three months are and already have been um, encouraging our members to submit their thoughts on the technical file as it exists at the moment and how it's doing the job of robustly protecting the present day and the potential for growth of Irish whiskey globally. Within that, members have an opportunity to look at the various clauses to see if there are things that they think should be addressed. You can be sure there will be some who will want to address the mash bill of single pot still, that mash bill issue, and with good reason. And you can be sure there will be others who will say, why would you try to fix something that isn't broken? So there's very good um, reasons for both, very good reasons why both arguments stack up. And ultimately, as chairman of the, of the association, I welcome this review of the technical file. It's not easy to change a technical file in the sense that you then have to convince many authorities that there's good reason to change it. But the review will happen with those in favor of change and those who aren't in favor of change. And I see it as a significant responsibility of the people on the Irish Whiskey Association committees and, and council now that we come to an agreement on what's right for the business and the category going forward. 
Graham Frazier points out it was interesting to hear from Peter Mulryan of uh, Blackwater Distillery on a live stream recently that traditionally oats were used in pot still whiskey distilling, which of course they were. And Ben Marnock points out that back in 2014, there were only three companies making the rules. Now there are 30 plus, so why stop innovation? So I haven't said we'd stop innovation. I don't know if Ben heard me right. I'm not saying we're stopping innovation. Yeah. There were a few more than three companies involved, oh, to be yeah. fair, uh, back in 2014. Oh, yeah. There were more than that. But um, his point is valid in that there are now many more whiskey companies uh, in the business than there were then. So we recognize that. And I speak with them. I sit with them on committees all the time. And I am meeting and encountering some of the most inspiring people ever to come, I could come across in, in the whiskey business when I sit with them and talk to them. So their, their, their opinions are every bit as valid as anyone who was there before, absolutely. I suppose what I would be saying is that all of us need to take on board the varying elements, one of which would be Fanon's research, a very important part of it, one of which is that the tradition hasn't been bad for the category, it's been very good for the category. And, and the other one we need to take on board is what's right for the future. And if that, if that would you, if you would describe that as the potential to innovate further, is that the right thing for the category? Then that gets discussed, agreed, etc. If innovation goes so far as a category becomes unrecognizable because there is no definitions because everything is about innovation, that's probably not a good thing either. So, uh, redefining things might be the right thing to do, but we will do it by agreement. Spirit Bomb Tabitha points out, and we'll just go from controversy to controversy. Many Irish distilleries are experimenting with that T word, terroir. Do you think it's a phase or something worth pursuing? So you could only think it's a phase if you thought it was going to stop in the near future. I don't think it's a phase. I think it's something that some distilleries really want to experiment with and are and are working well with and see value in it. Uh, not all distilleries are doing that. So I, I don't think it's a phase, but I don't think it necessarily becomes a standard that everybody does either. Um, and for those who are who take it very seriously and do a really good job with it, it's very important to them. Um, others pay attention to other areas. Um, and, and so uh, I don't think it's something that you could say is a phase, um, but I, I, neither do I necessarily believe that everybody is going to get into the terroir issue in the way that the people who are in it now are very serious about it. And uh, Peter Polkert asks, what did I just pour myself? Definitely not Tullamore, we are watching you. Well, Peter, you're not listening because I just said this was the J.J. Corey Chapelgate, uh, the battalion mezcal finish about five minutes ago. So uh, just to well, repeat myself. Well, I'm going to pour myself an 18-year-old. 18, 18 oh, please do. Go ahead. Yeah. And while so you're Peter doing Bulkers that, let me, just, those. Uh, let me just ask this one. Um, Richard Dankovic. Denkovic wants to know, will there be a Tullamore very rare in the offing? What are you guys uh, looking at coming out with as far as innovations that you can talk about without having to kill us? <laughs> I'd have to kill you uh, beforehand. Um, look, if you were working with Tullamore Jew and you visited our warehouses and you saw 300,000 different casks of whiskey, you would be forgiven for believing that there's something rare going to come out of that, okay? But those 300,000 casks, the oldest of them, as I said earlier, is six and a half years old. Uh, they would be rare in any case if the, if we were to launch a very limited release of, of 100 bottles of some cask, etc. Okay. It's not, uh, it's not in our immediate plans. Uh, as I said before, we want the, we want, if you like, the time for the whiskey to be right we're not we're not in any rush and i don't say that in any pejorative way to anybody else who decides to launch uh, quite soon after maturation is completed i don't say that they believe that their whiskey is right for talking about and right and ripe for selling uh, we we are, are of the conviction that we should wait longer until it's right for us we think it's appropriate to represent the amazing dist distillery that it has come from 
and therefore we won't be rushing to launch anything rare soon but when we do and if if and when we do it will be worth waiting for well i will admit that i trust brian's judgment on this stuff because i've not had you a know. bad whiskey yet from the guy so no, uh, no exa and exactly and he learned from and the best in the business in david stewart so stewart, exactly you've got david stewart and brian kinsman informing your decisions on what's right and, wh and when it's right you're not you're not going to go far wrong what what two brilliant guys and david stewart isn't it just wonderful to be able to still talk to david stewart and get access to his brain and oh yeah i love i love the guy he's fantastic yeah. i i want to get him on one of these webcasts and I've not been able to yet. That's uh, he's one of the guys uh, yes. I want to get on this show, and I want him to do it. But uh, and you know, Mark, he's <laughs> he's the kind of man. He's not shy. I don't want to say that, but he's gentle and he's quiet and he's unassuming and he's so he doesn't believe in his own importance, etc. And the rest of us have him on a pedestal, and he doesn't like that, you know. But anyway, yeah. So, uh, Dave says launch Tullamore Jew Blue and say it's super. <laughs> Yeah, that'll go over really well. Um, good question from Patrick Cole. Does Tullamore use different yeast strains or the same one all the time? Uh, do you use the basic um, distiller's yeast in your so whiskey? For, for, for the purposes of the Tullamore Jew that you drink, yes. Now, that sounds coy, but it could be that we'll have something in the future that might have used a different yeast strain, and it, it would not be the Tullamore Jew core brand that you know because we would choose to experiment maybe. So yes, is the, we use a, we use the distillery strain, but it could be that in the future, in the way that every, every as many distilleries would want some sort of in, innovation possibilities looked at, yeast could be one of those, yeah, of course. And Zidani wants to know if you're experimenting with different types of wood, uh, cherry, chestnut, mulberry, et cetera, the Irish whiskey regulations don't require oak as finishing casks, do they? They allow you to use other types of wood, right? In fact, it says wood. The, the technical file says wood such as oak, so it's not. Um, and 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 you know, going back to a question that we were asked earlier about um, innovation, you know that there's great potential for innovation in Irish whiskey in the, in that way that maybe. Um, our Scotch friends are a little bit hamstrung by. So, <clears throat> yes, uh, companies can try and use other other woods. Uh, the two that he's mentioned, chestnut and uh, uh, Zidane mentioned, but uh, uh, we Cherry haven't. Yeah, Cherry, no, we haven't been. We haven't got anything in those casks that I'm aware of, Zidane. But indeed, they, it could be they've done something that they haven't told me about. That's entire. I'm not joking. That's entirely possible. I could go down and say, by the way, we did something a few months ago. We didn't mention it because we wanted to see how it would work. But as far as I'm aware, we haven't done mulberry, cherry, or uh, chestnut. Ben Marnick, uh, does Tullamore use artificial enzymes in your mesh? I know it's allowed here in the U.S., banned in Scotland. Can you guys use enzymes? So it's allowed in Ireland, and it's particularly helpful when you're talking about uh, unmalted barley because um and so you, you you can assume that we do uh what most other distilleries will do which is for an an, an, an enzyme uh which is um as needed that we will add it you can assume that we would do as other you're breaking up there john and let's explain what that is artificial enzymes are uh, used in the fermentation process just to sort of jump start the fermentation and uh, produce more alcohol in the wash and during fermentation, and, to and they're particularly more alcohol. useful. So it's yeah. not, uh, yeah, it's, it's not illegal, and it's particularly helpful and sometimes needed when we when we're talking about unmalted barley, raw barley for a pot still mash. Now, um, Connor O'Hare has a good question: Have you guys done any? Would you ever do a beer cask finish? Uh, Jameson Cask Mates has been popular. A couple of other Irish distilleries have done uh, beer cask finishes. Has Tullamore considered it yet? We've considered it. Um, um, we have done some experimentation with it. Uh, I need to be very careful how I go with this. Um, I um, we, We've done it. We've actually done some work with a brewery in Ireland, and, and they actually launched one of their beers 
as a whiskey cask uh, finish in, in one of their uh, stouts, and it was a delicious stout. I we found that it was difficult to get a pronounced, um, how can I be that? A, a pronounced enough difference in the whiskey to warrant launching a whole new uh, whiskey um, f flavor, for want of a better expression. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the, the 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 beer didn't make enough of an impression on the whiskey to warrant uh, a launch of a new pack. That was my opinion at the time. I think a few people agreed with me, so we decided. You see, when you have limited resources in terms of people, but even maturation facilities, and particularly bottling lines that are running at 300 bottles a minute or whatever, um, it, it's, it's difficult to say, look, stop it. We want to produce something that we think is interesting and could be a market maker. Um, it better be interesting enough to, in terms of flavor profile and different enough to do that. And at the time, we didn't think we were getting enough flavor difference. It really depends on the beer, too, because stouts do really well. IPAs do well. Yeah. But a pale ale finish? No, I don't yeah. think so. It just no. doesn't add much to yeah. it. And uh, there are a lot of beers that just don't add much to whiskey. But we, you've got to, to really fair, have a really strong flavor. Yeah, we we did we did work with um, stouts, in fact, um, but um, I guess people like myself and Brian had conversations at the time, and were feeling that it it again, as I say, the the flavor profile change wasn't significant enough to warrant a whole new launch. Um, so we did we absolutely did experiment, and as I say, one you know a, 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 certainly one brewery, in fact I think two breweries in, t in total, one in Scotland, launched products that they uh, used they where they used Tullamore Dew cask ex whiskey casks for their beer to influence their beer. We'll finish up with one good question from Chris Ratcliffe. Uh, what is the biggest problem? He says hardest problem. I'll say biggest problem facing the Irish whiskey industry. And what's the highest achievement so far? And let's just narrow that back to the last 10 years. Uh, is it fair to call this the uh, the second or third golden age of Irish whiskey? Yeah. I, <clears throat> yeah, I think it is fair to say that. And when you're living in, as the Chinese say, interesting times, you're always wondering, are they more interesting than the ones before? Or are they more interesting than the ones to come? Because we don't know. Uh, but certainly it's been for me it's been a decade like no, no no other okay that's the first thing uh, in terms of growth notoriety people talking about it people loving irish whiskey and having you know they're being passionate people for irish whiskey all over the globe so that's great um what so is this i think the other question was what are the big challenges for irish whiskey yeah i think uh, one of the challenges for irish whiskey is that um we we get sales growth for a lot of the brands that aren't big. Now I'm saying that as the second largest selling Irish whiskey brand, but I think it is important for the industry that the smaller brands get a place in the sun as well, and they might even want to take market share from Tullamore Dew. That's not going to happen. I'm not going to let it, but I might let them take market share from others. But it, to be serious about it, I think it's important that they all start getting a good critical mass of business for the future. That's the first thing. So we will have a range, a good range of successful Irish whiskies, and it's not down to a handful, let's say. That's the first thing. The second thing is, and maybe it's a route to help that happen, is that we now start to penetrate markets where we're not significant and we're not well known. I'm talking about Asia. I'm talking about Latin America. In Africa, we're making some progress, no question about it. Um, but particularly Asian and, and Latin America. If you go to Asia, go to Taiwan, and look at the amount of Scotch single malts that are drunk in Taiwan. Look at the potential for Irish whiskey throughout Asia, as China develops, for example. Taiwan develops. Um, uh, Taiwan is a developed whiskey market. Thailand, um, Japan, obviously, Philippines. Many. Look, I, I'm, I'm going to insult a country by not mentioning it. Go to... San Diego and work your way down Central South America. Look at the business that Scotch whiskey can do in Colombia, in Mexico. Five million cases of Scotch whiskey in Mexico. Five million cases of Scotch whiskey in Mexico. It's incredible. So 
we haven't, as, a, as an industry, we haven't made an impact there yet. <clears throat> the potential for us to get so much more business in, and not just taking from Scotch whiskey, but attracting vodka drinkers, attracting cachaça drinkers, attracting tequila drinkers, attracting beer drinkers, as we have done in Europe, that's the potential for us. And, and when we take those two regions alone, that gives us, but also the smaller companies, great opportunities for the future. And I, today I had a conversation with a small whiskey company <clears throat> and, he, and we were discussing the big and the small guys. And he said to me, look, I'm never going to admit this, but he said, what you guys do for us is you fertilize, you fertilize the ground so that when we go into a place, a bar or a country or a region, they say to us, ah, yeah, Irish whiskey, yeah, we have Tullamore Dew or we have Jameson or we have Bushmills. And they'll say, yeah, maybe it's right we try something and have something new. So we, we don't want to be losing market share to anybody, but I want that whatever we create allows the small guys that are, I, I tell you, I have met some of the best. I'm going to tell you a story. It's a, about a guy. Okay, I visited a distillery in Donegal, okay? It's called Sleeve League Distillery. It's owned by uh, the Doherty family. And I was there sitting at a bench in the still house with James Doherty and his, and Deirdre Byrne, who works for him, a girl I knew actually. And we were chatting away and his mother in her seventies came in and said, James, you're going to have to do something about these labels. They're not going on straight. She's in the other part of the building, putting the labels, the foot labels on the bottle. And I thought, this is what is brilliant about the small Irish whiskey companies. And this is why I want them to succeed. And when they do, it'll be good for us. It'll be good for everybody. So the challenges are that the small brands start doing well. And the opportunity for them is not just in our markets, but when we break into the other Asia Pacific, Latin American markets, everybody will do well. And I know there was some talk earlier in the last few months that uh, you guys are looking at taking over the lead from Scotch whiskey in the United States in the next few years. Don't tell the Scots, for God's sake, keep that to yourself. Uh, I would say, yeah, that's, that's a statistic that's, that has been used many times by us and the Irish Whiskey Association. Because if you do look at the gap between Irish whiskey and Scotch whiskey in the States, it's actually narrowed significantly. Um, I think Scotch whiskey is between eight and nine million cases in the States. Irish whiskey is about three and a half million cases behind that. There was a gap of about nine, eight or nine million cases in the not too distant past. So if you, if to suggest that uh, we are going to take over from Scotch might be a stretch, but certainly the gap is narrowing and there'd be nobody massively surprised if we did actually cross the line and, and pass them out. Um, but I wouldn't want our Scotch whiskey friends and colleagues to be too worried. Just keep doing what you're doing. Don't do it any better. Just keep doing what you're doing. And sure, if we pass you out, you'll be grand. You know, you still have Taiwan. You know? John, thank you, my friend. It's been too hey. long since we've been together. I appreciate your time tonight. And uh, Listen, thank it's, you. It's again. been very enjoyable for me, Mark. And so everybody who's been calling and those I don't know and those I do know and those I'd prefer if I didn't know, um, it's, it's good kind of to see you all. <laughs> <laughs> well, one final question. You're from Zidane. What's your favorite Tullamore do all time? Heritage, 12-year-old Sherry, the Black 43, or what? Do you have a favorite? I know it's like asking you to pick your favorite kid, but uh, yeah. do you have a favorite TD? Uh, I'd say that three or four people are going to type in that they know exactly what my favorite is. Um, and I'm, Zidane might even know himself. I don't know. But I suppose if, if I had to be stuck on a desert island, and you said to me, you can't have all your Tullamore Jews, um, then I might actually, I might go for a 12 year old. Um, our 12 year old is a magnificent triple cask, triple blend 12 year old. Um, and it, it, for me, it delivers on so much in terms of what I love about a whiskey. I might have to pick that one, but I'd be very reluctant because if I was stuck on a desert island with Tullamore Jew original, I would be delighted. If I was stuck on a desert island with the 18 year old or the XO, any of them, I'd be delighted. But you know, if you're going to put me on the spot and say, if you had to breastfeed one bottle, 
for the rest of your life, then it might be it might be the twelve year old. It might be the twelve year old. It might change tomorrow, but maybe not. But what's the oldest Tullamore that you've had? Uh, from have the, you had some the, from back in the B Daily days? Uh, yeah, I had uh, a forty a forty one year old or whatever from the B Daily. Uh, there was a great pub in Tullamore, a great bar called. You might have been there. Um, called the Brewery Tap, and they had a very old bottle of uh, B Daily whiskey, and we sipped it. And we had Fanon O'Connor down there sipping it one night and waxing lyrically about the fl flavor profiles of the, you know, the uh, the leather infused cherry bomb that he was discussing or whatever. I'm not sure what he said, but he has a, an amazing facility with the English language, which uh, which is which impresses me beyond belief. But um, yeah, 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 not so as the gift of gab. Oh, he's he's incredible, and he's way too I young love, to be that. I love he's, that. Way, he's way too young he's, to be that good, by the way. He's annoying. He's annoying. Yeah. He's so good, you know. But uh, yeah, so so. But, <laughs> yeah, but like, we, we had that whiskey there with, and uh, we really enjoyed it. So yeah, uh, yeah. I've been lucky, lucky man. Okay, well, well, John, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, once yeah, again, it's a pleasure, take care, my friend. Give my best to everybody at the distillery, and hopefully. The good Lord will and will be able to see you guys at some point later this year and a few months from now when the uh, vaccinations are widespread yeah. and we exactly. get this stupid pandemic knocked down. When all of those are done, we'll have an injection of whiskey in Tullamore sometime. And as Tyrone Cote points out, thanks, John. You're in a perfect position with all the passion you have for Irish whiskey, though he did spell it without the E. <laughs> He's and forgiven. Some that. some Irish whiskey companies are spelling it without the E now as well. So we yeah, the allowed. new guys like Waterford. Yeah, what's the yeah, deal with that? That's allowed right you know, because um, because traditionally Irish whiskey was spelt both ways, and uh, so there's absolutely no problem with spelling it with the e. I spell it with with the uh, an E because it's it's been my my life and my tradition. But for those who spell it with the E, full marks, we say you know chapeau or whatever. Well done to them. Well, thank you again, John. Good Let night, me uh, say goodbye to everybody here. Um, once again, I want to thank John Quinn, our guest from uh, Tullamore, Dew, the Global Brand Ambassador, Chairman of the Irish Whiskey Association, for uh, joining us tonight. We've killed an hour and 23 minutes of your time that you'll never get back. But uh, we'll do some more of that next week because we have the one and only Jim McEwen from Brook Laddie, Ardenaho, Beaumore, and... Uh, one of the legendary Scotch whiskey icons of all time is going to join us on the show next Friday night for uh, what should be an interesting conversation. Jim is always one of my favorite interviews because all I have to do is ask one question and Jim will take care of the next five minutes. And all I have to do is just sit there and relax and nod my head and wait for Jim to finish. But Jim will be joining us next week. Uh, same time, same as usual, uh, same bat channel and all that fun stuff. But uh, we will have uh, Jim McEwen on the show next week. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, if you saw my note earlier, please, if you can, support uh, the Scotch Trooper, Brett Friends and his family. Here's the address once again. Uh, just If you don't have time to write down that address, just go to GoFundMe.com, search for Scotch Trooper, and uh, it'll take you right to the site. Uh, guys, take care of yourselves. Wear your masks. I saw a woman today in Whole Foods when I was out with my grandson getting some pizza slices who was yelling at the manager about not having to wanting to wear a mask. And oh I'm just looking at her going, wear the damn mask. Come on, let's take care of each other. Good night, all. <laughs>